Now to start with, most of you guys were already taking the uh, storyboarding class, and we've already talked about this ad nauseum. You're going to hear it again. Organization is so very important. In the same way that the computer looks for different files and likes things where they like them, Maya is even more specific. Maya is a very demanding software. She likes things the way she likes them. Okay? If things aren't the way she likes them, you will have problems. You'll more than likely have some problems anyway, but that is the big kicker. All right? Now, the good news is that Maya will automatically create folders for you so long as you've started with one folder and told it where to go. All right, now, for those of you who have brought your thumb drives, we're going to start there. If you would, please create a folder and simply call it 3D Modeling Class or MA, you know, whatever will help you to recognize that this class is unique from the others. So I'll go class materials, 3D modeling. There it is. Okay. Now, I've created a folder simply inside of my 3D modeling, and I'm going to call it week one. Now, right now, there's nothing in it, okay? And I want to show you that there's nothing in it. This isn't a magic trick or anything. I'm not like, nothing on my sleeve. Woo. But there really is nothing in this folder. I've simply made it because the next step is very important. Inside of Maya, and by the way, if this little window pops up, this essential skills, just click on don't show again and close it. We don't need that right now. We don't need it ever. Before we begin any assignment, any project, any anything, Maya wants to know where to begin saving things to. It also wants to be able to automatically put files in their respective folders. In many cases, when you guys are working with different things, you can kind of sparse them out, and sometimes your uh, operating system will let you just search for whatever it is you're looking for. That is not the case here. It is very specific, it is very demanding, and if you don't do this, you may run into serious problems later. Maya allows you to do what's called creating and setting your project. That means Maya wants to know where should everything go? Where should I expect everything to be? Okay. Now, to create a project is this. We go to File, down to Project, and we choose New because we're creating a brand new project. Now, the first thing that it wants to know is, what is the name of your project? Not the name of your 3D file, what is the name of your project? So for me, this will be week one. And then it says, where is it? And I have to choose a location. I'm going to choose the folder that I just created on my thumb drive under week one. Once I'm inside of that folder that is empty currently, that's where I'm going to put everything. All right. Now, I hit open and notice that that's the location that it's sitting in. We now know that that's where it's going to be. Underneath that is an enormous list and we see that it says scenes and it allows me to type something in images, and it allows me to type something in. Source images, and it allows me to type something in. We could potentially tell Maya where each one of these files should go, but there's an easier way to do it. Down at the bottom, there's a setting simply called Use Defaults. If I click on Use Defaults, Maya fills that in for me. Say thank you. 
And then we hit accept. Now, it doesn't seem as though much has happened, but if I go back into that week one folder, I have a new week one folder in it. Now, if we open that up, look what we have. Yeah. We have an enormous library of folders. Just to let you know, you will use some of these, and you may not. Because when you first start out, you won't need to know whether or not you are using your FBX and your FBX export folder. That's not really going to be necessary at our level. However, just know that source images is really important. And the images folder is really important. And the scenes folder is definitely important. Okay, now, we've created this folder full of all these different folders, and that is our project. That means that when we begin making our objects, our objects are going to end up in the scenes folder. When we start making textures for that scene, or for that file, they will end up in the source images folder. If we, sorry? Sorry, I said not the textures file? No. Because Maya likes things the way that they like them. The other folders are actually if you start inbreeding with other programs. Okay? So just understand that the default locations, if you keep them within this range, and you take it with you, and you go to another computer that has Maya, and you plug it in, and you load your program, if you haven't set the program to know what this folder is, then it won't be able to find your source images. And it won't be able to find your other models. And it's going to say, it's all missing, so I don't get to render anything for you. Now, if we come over back to my Maya scene, currently it says that I am working inside of untitled, and there's an asterisk. What does the asterisk mean? You haven't saved it. <laughs> yes, uh, it means I haven't saved anything yet. Okay. Now. Even though we haven't actually created anything in this scene, I could go to File, Save As, and notice where it put it. When I open up and say Save As, instantly it says Art Institute 3D Modeling Week 1, Week 1 Scenes. This is why it's so important to create a project. Because otherwise, it wouldn't know where to save things. So I can save this as, let's just call it week one model. And notice that at the bottom of the thing it says, what kind of file type are we saving this as? And it is a Maya binary file. Who knows what binary is? It means that the entire file is created with nothing but billions of ones and zeros that tell the computer what it is. There is another option. There is a Maya ASCII file, A-S-C-I-I. -I. We don't really need that right now, but just so you know, the ASCII file is a Word document. You can actually open it and see the words of everything that you've created. If you get really into it, you can go into that file without even opening Maya and change things. You can change the color green into the color yellow simply by opening up the text document, but we will not be getting into that. Okay? Now, I'm going to keep it as a Maya binary and I'll hit save. And now we have a file to begin working in. Okay? Now, this is going to be a little funny. But the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about the user interface, or UI. And by the way, if you've purchased the book, the first chapter does nothing but walk you through the buttons. It kind of introduces you to what Maya is and how it works, and it's important to read this. Chapter number two is your very first project, and that's what you'll be doing this weekend. Okay? Now, currently, we see this gradient. The gradient is very pretty. Thank you, Gradient, for being pretty. I'm going to show you how to turn it off. 
because it only gets in the way. Okay? So we can go to Window, Settings and Preferences, and go to Preferences. Hold on, I just had it. Is it under file? No, no, no. It's under window. Here, I'll get cancel again. Window, settings and preferences, preferences. There it is. Thank you. Underneath display, there's the last one. Background gradient. Sorry, guys, I've been talking since 9 o'clock this morning. All right, background gradient, we want to turn it off. Now, for those of you who had your heart set on that pretty grid background, it only gets in the way for two reasons. The first reason that it gets in the way is when I start making my animated videos for you guys to work along with, it only adds complication and it becomes very difficult to see what I'm doing. So with this simple gray background, it allows you to focus on what's important. Okay. Now, that gray gradient background, that nice pretty gradient is great for when clients walk in because then you can bring your model up and there's a pretty gray background. Oh, nice. Okay. They've, they've created this user interface and they've done some things that I'm not absolutely happy with. Now, honestly, I'm a creature of habit. I like things the way that I like them. I've been using this program since 1998. And 2011 was the first time they put that grid in there. It's difficult for me to even look at it because I'm not used to seeing that in my world. I don't want to see a gradient if I haven't made it. Do you know what I mean? Because if something has a gradient in a world, I want to know why it's there. Because if it's not supposed to be there, I didn't make it, then I know there's something wrong. If I have this nice, simple, gray, boring background and I see something with an object that looks like a gradient that I didn't make, I said, there's a problem with that object. I gotta go fix it. Okay? Now, currently, there is a enormous amount of stuff in this view. It is oftentimes overpowering but just like how we were going through Premiere in the last class, and there was so many different things, I'm just going to point out a couple of things that are important to know. Okay? Right now, down here, what do we have? Oh, sorry. I'll do this. This right here. I have a timeline. This timeline will allow me to animate. Unfortunately, we can't turn that off while we model. So just be very careful not to accidentally hit the S key while you're doing something, or else you will begin setting keyframes. That means that when you are all finished with your object, and then you suddenly jump to frame two, and your object changes or disappears or goes back to the beginning, that's because you accidentally started keyframing it. Okay? How did you fix that? Uh, you have to go in and delete the, his, the delete the keys off of the object. So the first thing that we can do is we can just look over and hopefully, yeah, yeah, you can see this. Um, it's just off a little bit, but this is the window. This right here is some of your standard tools, okay? These standard tools are how you manipulate an object. You can come over here and grab the move tool, or you can simply hit the W key. Now, for Maya, and this should go in your notes, even though it will become second nature after a while, there is move, rotate, and scale, and that is W, E, R. They are the three keys right next to each other on the keyboard. Okay, so we have W to move, E to rotate, and Q to scale. <laughs> Did you 
you said it's eight, but whatever. No, no, no. It's not doing it based on the letter. It's doing it by the position on the yeah. keyboard. <laughs> yeah, we're not looking at it as if M is to move or nothing like that. We're looking at Q, okay? Q simply goes back to that selection that you don't move. But it's EWR, move, rotate, scale, EWR. And they're right there on the keyboard, right next to you. So Q, W, E, R are your first set of buttons that you need to get used to. Now, just so you know, when you really start working inside of Maya, you can set your own hotkeys. Hotkeys are buttons that tell it to do something. Usually it's a command up at the top somewhere, or you can hit a key or a combination of keys. Um, imagine you're playing a video game and it's you know right, left, uppercut kind of stuff, okay? Hotkeys mean you jump to what you're trying to do a little bit faster. Maya has a ton of them by default, or you can change them for your own. I would suggest not changing them until you really start understanding what it is you're doing. I would also say that even though there are ways to make shortcuts, say, oh no, all I have to do is this over here, and it becomes a button on my shelf. I never have to look for it again. It doesn't really help much the next time you're on some other computer, because then you can't remember where it really was. So we might be doing it the slow way at first, but it's only so that we know exactly what it is we're trying to do for when we get to the end, okay? Now, currently, what you're looking at is the perspective view. That's what that P-E-R-S-P -E at the bottom of the screen means. Your perspective view is your default camera for the real world. Okay? You are able to move that view as if you are literally walking through the world. There are also other views that are called orthographic views. If you tap the space bar while you're inside of that main window, you get this four screen view. Now notice that this one over here the top left, uh, right one is still your perspective view. The one to the left of that is the top view. It's looking at things from above straight down. These orthographic views are not in perspective, meaning that you will not see the world going away from you and getting smaller. It's more like a blueprint. Everything is straight up and down. Okay? So orthographic views would be perfect profile, perfect straight down, like a blueprint, okay? Now, if I want to focus on one of these windows, all I have to do is move my mouse into that area and hit the space bar again. And that enlarges that view so that we can only concentrate on this new view. Now, notice that down here on the side, you have some automatic view arrangements. Now, like I said, I am a creature of habit, and I got into the habit a long time ago of simply tapping the space bar, choosing the view I want, and tapping it again. Now, you can, of course, choose a different one simply by doing that. Okay? Notice that these will bring you to different aspects, different views, different layouts. Some of them are going to look a little weird because they're probably using windows that we've not talked about yet. Okay? But this is the one thing that I'm not quite a fan of, like for this. Did everybody just see that? Yeah, a little menu. No. From, I'll, I'll go back to the beginning. Okay. Let's say that this is the view that everybody sees, and I come down here and I make the front view full screen, and I say, no, no, go back to the perspective view. No problem, right? Everything looks fine. Hit the space bar again. Where's the perspective view now? It is changing the view you have selected, okay? Which means that you have to go back and reset it. Otherwise, when you jump back to the four view, you're like, wait a minute, how did that get down here? So in my mind, it just it frustrates the crap out of me 
because it's not what I'm expecting when I jump back out. When I jump back out, I expect to see what I expect to see. So again, I'm, I'm this you know devilish creature of habit. I want things the way that I'm used to seeing them. When I don't see them the way that I am used to, it takes me a while to get used to the new thing. And sometimes the new thing isn't as good as the way it was before. Okay? So let's just jump back to our perspective view, wide, full screen. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to turn and move inside of our view. All right? Now, the first thing that you need to do is get your hands ready because this takes both hands. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to use your left hand and most of the time I use either my index finger or my middle mouse uh, or middle finger to hold down the alt key. The alt key is telling Maya I want to do something from within the view that I'm looking in. So if I hold down the alt key and I press the left mouse button, the regular click button, I get this new icon. Everybody see this? It turns into a spinner. That means that if I move it left and right only, I start to spin around the view. If I move it up and down, I'm looking at the underside of my object or the top of my object. Okay, so left and right spins around, up and down, goes under or above. Now, I will tell you right now, if you go too far, you'll get this. If you find yourself in a situation where you're not quite sure where you are, notice this little box up here. Notice that the letters are even upside down to show you that you are, in fact, upside down. Okay? Also, down here at the bottom of your screen, where it says X, Y, and Z, Y is up. If Y is pointing down, you're upside down, okay? The easiest way to fix that is come over here to this little view cube and click on the home, and it'll instantly flip you back to the beginning where you started. It's a nice little get out of jail free card. Yes? Why is Y over Z? Because Z is death. And your view doesn't have the cube at the top, okay? Um, hit the space bar uh, inside of that view, tap it. Okay, come back over there and go to Window, go to our Settings and Preferences, go to Preferences, and it's under the UI Elements. Now go to Display. Oh, View Cube, there it is. Go to the View Cube, switch the View Cube on there. All right. The next thing that I'm going to show you, <coughs> how many people have played a shooting game on a video game? How many people know what the term strafing means? This is what strafing means. I am not moving forward. I am not moving backwards. I'm going side to side. This is strafing. Okay? Strafing is by holding down alt and using... Now, this is going to be a little tricky because our mice have scroll wheels. If you press down with your scroll wheel while holding alt, you get this. Okay? Now, be careful because sometimes a scroll wheel will think you're scrolling back and forth. You have to press straight down, otherwise that's not working. I was uh, trying to figure that out one time. Ah, good luck. <laughs> you can set it like a regular the mouse. mouse. The little mouse yeah. ball on the max that you can press. In. Yeah, but that's annoying. And it hurts yeah. my hand to try it. It's as simple as that. Everybody's like, do you want to put Maya on the Mac or the PC? Uh, put it on the PC. Um, for many people, no. For many people, um, they, uh, for, for people who own Macs, they have to buy like bigger, more expensive mice with all these additional buttons and stuff. And unfortunately, a lot of the hotkeys that I'm showing you, which are default, are something that's telling a Mac something else. Like, for example, we're going to get into using like F1 and F2 and F8. On a Mac, if you just hit F8, that's like changing a menu inside of the OS. So you have to hit like the function key and then F8 or else it won't work. 
But um, you know, in my uh, in my tutorial videos, if I can remember that it's always a little different in a Mac, I'll try to mention it. But just get into the habit of not expecting it. Like I'll try as often as I can to do that. But if you're working on a Mac at home, you're gonna have to read the help menu a lot, which is where F1. 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 Unless it's on a Mac, because it could mean anything. <laughs> All right. So, using the middle mouse button and holding down the Alt key, I can slide around inside of my view. Now, the other thing to do is to scroll in and out using the scroll wheel. Now, if I push up on the scroll wheel, I begin zooming closer. And if I scroll down on my scroll wheel, I move away from it. Okay? Now, notice though, depending on the mouse you have, if it's like the mice here where it clicks, then we're moving at a given distance for every click. If you want a smoother transition, if you hold down Alt and use both the index button, the left mouse, and the middle mouse, and hold them down at the same time, you get a smoother zoom. That's an older way of doing it, or you can hold down Alt and right-click only, and that will also give you that. The reason that they have so many different ways of doing it is because as Maya progressed and the technology got better, uh, everybody who was an old user still wanted the same combination for keys, and then they said, well, scroll wheels are becoming more popular. See, when Maya first came out, nobody knew what a scroll wheel was. It was simply a three-button mouse. There were three buttons on it, and you pressed down, and they clicked. In fact, I, uh, in my uh, ancient crankiness, went on eBay and found 10 or 15 three-button mice simply so that I could never run out. <laughs> they usually die every two years or so, so I'm good for the next decade. <laughs> Um, well, what happened was the uh, there's a particular one, and it was SGI, which how many people even know what SGI is? Silicon graphic imagery. Silicon graphics were the machines to own if you had $65,000. Um, they had a whopping two megabytes graphics card in it. Whoa. <laughs> I know. Woo! Oh my gosh! I know. We can play Pong in HD. <laughs> Pretty much. No, you Super tall. What's HD? What do you mean? HD? Head what? Hard drive. No. Um, the problem is that as technology improves and mice become different, Maya had to start changing along with it. Okay? Now, I know that everybody's itching to do something. Everybody was playing around a little bit. So why don't we go ahead and create a box? Also known as a cube. Now, this will be my first cube. <laughs> all right, settle down now. All right, hang on a second. And again, and now we're rolling again. Now, to create your first object, you go to create. Now, notice that there's a lot of different things that we can create. There's something called a NURBS primitive. There's something called a polygon primitive. There's something called a subdiv primitive. We're dealing with polygons for now. We'll get into NURBS, don't worry, but we're gonna do polygons first. So we're gonna choose polygon primitive cube and just click on cube. And the first thing that it's gonna ask you is to drag the base of the grid and then pull away from the height. Now, what it's talking about is you have to manually create the shape of the cube that you want. This is something that was a and watch, as I drag across the grid, I'm creating my cube. As soon as I let go, it says, now drag upward to, to make the entire shape. This is something that 3D Studio Max has been doing for a long time, and it irks me to death. Okay? Now, there is a simple setting that we can change if we don't want our cubes to have to be created like this. If you prefer to do that, no problem. But I'm gonna show you how to undo. So I'm simply going to delete that cube and I'm gonna go back up to create. I'm gonna to go to polygon primitives and down here at the bottom it says interactive creation. It's toggled. If I check that and I go back to it, notice that it's turned off. 
so that if I hit create cube, watch what happens. There's cube. Now, this is a cube. A cube is equal on all sides. It is one by one by one by one by one by one. So you have the option to either draw one out if you like, or turn that off and simply create it. Because this is what I prefer, because not only is it a perfectly scaled cube, it also lives dead center. And when I mean dead center, it starts from the zero, zero, zero axis. Now, remember in math class, when you had grids, right? We have grids going in the Y, we have grids going in the X, and you had to go up two and over three and put a point, and then eventually you came up with either a pattern or a design or something. The same thing is happening in here, only it also adds Z, which is depth. And the reason that it's called Z is because in filmmaking, even on a television, you have your Y and your X, and Z is always depth. No, it's but but no, he Eric, he was asking. Okay, now currently it's very small on my screen. If this object is selected, and by the way it is, and I know that it is because it's green. If I click away from it, it turns blue. If I click on it, and I can do that either by clicking on it or I can drag a marquee around it. See that? Okay, it's highlighted. It also gives me some information on the side. This little area is called the channel box, and it gives you a little bit of information about this object. It tells you the name of the object. It is currently P cube one, which is a wonderful name. I prefer Paul. It also tells you where it is in the world, and it is currently sitting at zero, 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 scale of one. If I move this, and how do we move it? What's the key to move something? <laughs> w. So we hit W, and I get arrows. Now, if you grab hold of an arrow, you can only pull it along that axis. And if you move it, notice that the numbers up here change in my channel box. It's keeping tabs on your object. Now, if I moved it in the Y, it's going up. If I go in the opposite direction, it's going down. If I drag on the blue one, I'm going along the Z. Or I can grab hold of the center, and then I'm free to move it anywhere I want. But be careful, because when you're inside of the perspective view, what, excuse me, what you think is moving it accurately probably won't be. be yes. What if I want to get it back to where I had it to begin? That's where we're going. Now, there's two ways that you can go back to where you started. Either simply hit control, hold down control and hit Z, undo, 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 and then it goes back to where you started. Or I'll move it again. Or you can do this. If the translates are all sorts of different numbers, and translate simply means it's been moved, okay? If I select inside of this area and drag, I can highlight all three of them at the same time, and I hit zero and enter, and it goes right back to the beginning. Yes, sir? Is there a way to set it so it snaps to each box in the grid? There is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's day one, man. you got to give me a little bit of time. All right. Now, we have a single cube. And we can see through it, right? And if I hold down my Alt key and I use my left mouse button, I can spin around my object. If I use my scroll wheel, I can get closer and I can look around it. I can also, if it gets really far away and I lose track of it, if it's selected, I can hit the F key and I instantly frame whatever is selected. It's often very helpful. Okay, so write that one down. That's a good one. All right. That also means that if I start strafing too far away and I kind of lose where I am and I'm way over here and it's not making a lot of sense, if that object is selected and I hit F again, now I'm focusing on that. And not only am I looking at it, I'm also spinning around it. 
okay? I know this is a lot to take, guys. That's why we're taking it really, really slow. All right? Now, let's say, for example, I don't want to look at just a wireframe. And this is what a wireframe is. I can see straight through it. This object, believe it or not, has a solid shape to it. And the only way that we can see that is to change the view so that it is solid. And the easiest way to do that is hit the number five. Now it looks like a solid box. You hit the number three. <laughs> yeah, don't 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 get that far. <laughs> Not yet. I don't know how it got there. Uh, okay. If anybody's accidentally clicked on the number three button with that polygon selected, you now have a box, a, a circle instead of a box. <laughs> it looks like it would look like this, guys, or it might look like that. Well, it's it's more or less. What this is is it's allowing you to see what a preview version when you smooth it. Just know that. It doesn't change the object. Everything is the same. If that happens, it simply means you accidentally hit the three key. Hit the one key, and it goes back. OK? This is the way the object looks, and this is the way we want it to look. OK? Now, if we right-click on our object and hold down the right-click, we get this little gadget that comes up. This little gadget allows me to choose elements that this object is made of. Because uh, inside of geometry, a surface is made up of polygonal points, edges, and faces. And that's what this little guy is made of. Points, also known as vertices or vertex points. So if we move with our right mouse still holding down, I can drag over and look at what I get. I get like this little, it's like a lasso tool. It's a, it's a rubber band that I can aim in different directions by holding down and pulling away from it. And one of them will be highlighted. If I pull to the vertex and I let go, you should see this. Your outline becomes blue. And on the corner of every one of these little polygons, you have a purple point. These purple points are how you change the shape of your object. OK? Now, is everybody here? If I use my marquee tool, simply by dragging around like that, I can select one of those points. If I make sure that I'm in Move or W key, I can move this point around and change the shape. So if I drag away from it, I'm changing the shape of my polygon object. If I select more than one point, I'm changing more than one side or more than one part of my object. If I select a bunch of them, I can move them. Okay? Now, I'm going to hold down control and kind of undo because I don't want it to look junky like that. I want it to stay a cube. And then I'm going to right click and let's go into edge mode. Now notice the little pink points disappear because we can select the edges. And we can move the edges just like we could. And I'm going to hit Z to undo that. Now here's a different one, okay? This is something that I need to point out. If I right click and go to my face, as I move my mouse around, you see that the face wants to be highlighted. And if I click on it, then that's what I've selected. There's a problem with this though. Go to the side view. Let's hit the space bar and look at it from a side view. Let's say for example, I'm here in my side view and I want to take this face and pull it this way. How do you select the face? Uh, which are you selecting the back face? Or? No, I want to select this face right here. This one right here. The one that go that I could pull it this way. Okay, this is what's happening, guys. By default, Maya 2011 
has created a new option where you can no longer select a face without seeing it dead on. Okay, everybody right click on that object and go back to object mode and that will allow you to simply select the object as it is again and it should turn green if it's working. And what we're going to do is we're going to go up to window, go to settings and preferences and we're going to change one more thing in our preferences. Okay, what we're looking for is just underneath the settings window and it's under selection and it's right here in the center, polygon selection. Do you want to see the whole face or would you rather select from the center? If I change it to the center and hit save, when I come back here and change back to my faces view, look at what I get now. I get a little handle to grab a hold of so that if I'm looking at it from a different view, I can use a marquee and grab the face I want without accidentally selecting other faces. Now, this may not make a whole lot of sense right now, but I promise you, when you start making really complicated things, especially faces, like human faces or character faces, and you jump to the side view because you want to make the nose a little longer, not being able to select the faces without selecting everything else around it becomes very difficult. Okay? Now, again, it is your choice. How you want to see this is your choice. But know that this is how I'm going to do it. So in my videos, you'll see this, and that's how we want to work. Okay? Like I said, it's entirely up to you. But this is what I do. Because now that I have that face selected, I can drag it. And if I use my number four key, I go back to wireframe and I can see exactly which faces I want to grab. Because you can see that each, each face has that little handle. Now for me, it just, it's what I'm used to seeing. It's what I prefer. And when things start to get more complicated, it makes a lot of sense. It also allows me to do this. Watch this. Now, the way that it was before, if I tried to marquee across like this, because it's touching the other faces, all of it would have been selected. But now, because I didn't select these individual points over here, it only selected this one. It's easier for me to grab a hold of things, which means I get to work faster. It's entirely up to you. Okay? All right, now, I hit number five, and I go back to the view. And right now, I'm still blue, right? I'm, my object is still blue. That means that I am not in my object mode. I am not able to move the entire object. I am still in that way where you can only select bits and pieces of my object. So I need to right click and go back to object mode so that I can select the whole object as it is. All right? Now, if I pull back a little bit, just by zooming out, and I use my E key to rotate, I'm going to rotate this object upward. Now notice that as I do that, I have an option, because if I rotated it and I looked over here, it says, oh, you're rotating it in the Z axis, and I've done it negative 90.052. If I'm looking for a perfect rotation, I can simply come over here, and change that to 90, and now I know that I'm absolutely perfect. The rotation has been put perfectly. There are other ways to do it, we'll get into those, but I don't want to throw too much at you. For right now, this is what I want you to do for just a little while. I want you to practice creating cubes, and I want you to move them, and then create another one, and move that, and scale them using the R key, and move them using the W key. And I want you to start building 
a little series of squares, different heights, different lengths, different sizes, along this grid. Because as you do that, you're also going to start doing this. Holding down the Alt key, you'll use your middle mouse button to scroll, or excuse me, to strafe back and forth. And then holding down Alt and your index button, or your left mouse button, you'll start spinning around the object. Again, if you start getting lost, if your objects are way over there and things aren't working, select the object and hit F and you get closer to it and now we're back on track. So what I want you guys to do is just kind of make a little forest of different shaped cubes as you practice moving around your view. That's all we're doing right now. This is essentially learning to walk. notice it's getting really warm in here? Yes. Uh, welcome to Maya. <laughs> um, because Maya uses so much of the graphics power, not to mention these monitors, yeah, um, it's using a lot of electricity, which means it's generating a lot of heat. And these are a lot of machines trying to pump out a lot of information. Okay. Okay, so simply by selecting my cube and hitting Control-D to duplicate, and then selecting those two and hitting Control-D, and then selecting those four and hitting Control-D, I got an entire city out of it, right? Well, that's only in my way right now, and I want to delete everything so that I can start from the very beginning, because I'm going to show you the next series of tools that will help you to build things, okay? Now, if I go to Create, polygon, and I choose a cube. I now have the cube that everybody has seen so far. Now I'm going to just zoom in a little bit and hit the Q. The Q key allows me to keep the object selected without having one of those moving tools or rotation tools in my way. Okay. Now if we look over here at the side of the screen, there's something just underneath what we were looking at with the translate and the rotate and it's called inputs. Inputs, if we click on the word polycube1, we have more information here. This is what's known as construction history. Because this object is full of math, we have the opportunity to change the object before we have to do it manually. All right? Now, Notice that it says height 1, width 1, depth 1. Now, I can obviously change those numbers to increase the height, increase the width, increase the depth. 
What I can also do, and this is the important part, is change the number of subdivisions. What on earth am I talking about? Well, if we have a top and a bottom, to subdivide something is how many pieces in between. Okay? Now, if I change this first number, the subdivision width from 1 to 3, look what I get. I now have a cube that's been divided in three pieces along one axis. If I go back to one, it's as if it never happened. If I change subdivision heights to three, I get subdivisions along the outside there. Notice also, if I right click on this object and go to vertices, I have lots and lots more to choose. And if I go into four to see my wireframe, now you can really see it. Now, in the same way that you could choose a point and move it around, you can also, hitting the four key and looking at it at an angle, if I use my marquee tool and select all the points on the inside, I can even scale to make it smaller, or I can scale out to make it bigger. Now if I hit the number five, it's happening to all the sides, I just can't see it happening on all sides. Okay? I can also make it smaller but longer in one direction. Because I can pull the scale in one direction or if I scale from the center cube, I'm scaling in all directions. Everybody with me so far? Okay, I'll undo until we go all the way back to the beginning. Do you have this? Do you have a cube with a couple of subdivisions? Okay, then I'll go all the way back and we'll do it all over again. Here it is, here's my cube, okay? Okay, wait a minute, did you just make it or is that a duplicate? Remember, I deleted everything out of my scene and made a new cube. Understand, guys, duplicate objects do not have this input information. Okay? So if you can't find it, it's because you used the duplicate on one of your cubes and held on to that one and tried to do it. Okay? This input history is only available right now. Of course, there is a way to make duplicates have all that information, but we're not getting into that yet. And here we should have inputs, polycube, and right here is subdivision height. Now, I can manually put a number in, or I can do this. If I click on and highlight the word subdivision height and move inside of my viewable screen, if I hold down my middle mouse button, I can drag until I get the number that I want. Or I can reduce by dragging in the opposite direction and they go away. Now, a word of warning. This input information is only available in the beginning. If you have started to manipulate your object and then go back and try to change those numbers, you're going to get a freak out, like what Clay was just looking at, where the object was shooting off into space for no particular reason. Maya likes things the way that they like them. Construction history cannot go back and be changed if you've started to change your object in a different way. Does that make any sense? Because if I change this back to 1 and I scale it tall, simply because I scaled it, I can still change that number. I can make the height and it still works. Everybody see that? No problem. However, let's say, for example, I grab this vertice here and I move it out some. And then I go back to object mode and I try to use that same thing. 
The reason is because as we increase the number of vertices, we're actually changing the name of every point. See, on, on an object, every vertice is present and accounted for. They have a number. If you move something and it says, okay, number five is out in space, and then suddenly you start adding faces or adding edges into it, number five suddenly ends up at the bottom. And so it says, okay, well, you said it was out that far. That's what's happening. So I'm going to undo, 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 undo. And here we are, we're back to this. So right click and go back to object mode. And then I can still increase or decrease the number of faces. Now, just understand that this is basically the starting point. There are other ways to increase the number of edges that you have. Okay? If I change this number back to one, and I still want an edge, but I've already changed it like this. Up at the top here, it should say animation on that little tab. Before you change it, watch my screen. Watch the top up here with all of these different menus. As I change it to polygons, that whole series of menus changes. That's why when I said Maya has 5,000 buttons, I wasn't kidding. Because there are whole series of menus specific to the object you're working with. So inside of polygons, I have a bunch of different tools that I can use to change my polygon object. If I go to edit mesh, and by the way, a mesh is simply a polygon object. Thank Autodesk for deciding to name it a mesh. All the people who use 3D Studio Max are happy because it's the same word. It never used to be. It was always polygon. Edit the polygon. Because what is it? Well, it's a polygon. Now it's a mesh. Okay? We can come down and choose Insert Edge Loop Tool. And if I click on one of the edges and drag up and down, I can choose to place a new border line that goes all the way around. From there, I can go into my vertex by right-clicking and choosing a point and then changing it. If I go back into that same tool again, and by the way, any tool that you've just recently used will be the last icon on the bottom of your toolbox. So I've already used that tool. I'll click on it again. And then I'll click it and let go, and I've made one. And I can click it and let go, and I've made another. And if I click on one from the, from the side, I'll go all the way around the top. So now I'm beginning to break up my object so that I can scale and change my object. Now, I'm doing it kind of fast, and that's okay, because I have the video, and it will be available on the Z drive tonight. As in, like, as soon as we're done. So that means that if you have a thumb drive, you may take it home with you. You may watch it. It's just a quick time movie. Anything should play it. In fact, Windows Media Player and Windows 7 can even play it. So that you can follow along and watch what we're doing. The other video tutorial that I will have for you for next Thursday begins to create our first assignment. Now, when I say our first assignment, I'm not talking about the maze that we're going to create today. Because the maze that we're going to create today is our practice role. Just like how you were building cubes, I would like you to use the tool that we just used. Okay, That's the insert loop tool. And then I'm going to show you one more tool, and then I'm going to let you go. And I want you to only use those two tools and creating objects and positioning and scaling them to make a maze as in walls that turn and that kind of thing, okay? Now, I'm simply going to delete this object, and I have to go into object mode so that I can select it and delete it. And I'm going to create a new polygon cube so that I can show you one more tool which is very, very important. You'll use this all the time. 
If I right click on my object and go down to face, I can choose one of my faces. We've done that before, that's no big deal, right? If I again come up to edit mesh, the very first option on the uh, uh, box up here, aside from keep faces together, which is important, keep faces together, the video that I've already made for next week goes through that whole thing. Yes? What do you see edit mesh? Uh, you have to make sure that your options are set to polygon here. Okay. Also, if you hit F3, that's going into your polygon menu. Okay? Now, edit mesh, extrude. What we get is this. This strange, bizarre combination of things. Because we have extruded, believe it or not, there is now another polygon <coughs> sitting here. If I grab hold of my blue arrow and pull away, you can see that there it is. All right, you didn't have your face selected. So that's the one face. Okay, now see it. There it is. I grab the blue. No, no, grab the blue arrow. There you go. Okay, has everybody got that? Pretty much looking like this? We grab the top of the, of the polygon, we grab the top face, we extrude it, and we pulled it away. Now that that object is pulled away, we can see what we're beginning to make. Okay? Now, I can also choose to, to scale the object simply by clicking on one of these boxes. Just click on it. Don't drag yet. Just click. And notice that the center has also created a center scale. If I choose that center scale, I can drag it and scale it down. Or I can drag it the opposite direction and scale it out. Now, what might we be able to do with this? Well, if I scale it down and I move it down and then I extrude again and I pull it out and then I extrude again and then I scale it out and then I extrude again and I make it longer, I'm creating an object. I'm shaping my object. Now, I was able to extrude again and again and again and again very quickly because I know a hotkey. In Maya, anything that you've told it to do, and in this case it was extrude, you can say do it again simply by hitting the G key. So with one of those faces selected, hit the G key, and you should instantly be able to continue working. And rescale, hit the G, pull it up again, hit the G, scale, hit the G, move it up again. Now make sure you have faces selected and not uh, anything else, because we're trying to extrude only the faces for right now. If you start selecting things like edges or anything else, you're only going to end up with issues, okay? Now, let's say, for example, right now we've only been going and extruding in one direction. Well, let's say I want to extrude this way. Now, I've been saying extrude, so I'll hit say again, and I'll extrude outward. And then I'll hit it again, and I'll extrude again. And I'll hit it again, and I'll extrude again. Now this is kind of fun. If I select this edge and the opposite side, now notice that these two faces aren't touching each other. They're on opposite sides. And I say extrude, and I pull. I'm extruding both sides in the same direction at the same scale. Now, understand, this is going to take a little bit of time. It's going to take practice. But there's nothing wrong with taking your time and practicing. It'll only make your work better. Okay? Uh, hold down shift, just like anything else. Okay.